will uh, get straight into the uh, one slide that uh, I have today. Uh, so last year I wrote this uh, post that uh, introduced uh, this uh, concept of DIAC and uh, in general was basically uh, responding to a lot of the uh, discussion that was happening at the time around techno-optimism, the uh, need to be uh, more optimistic about technology and to appreciate the uh, very positive uh, impact that technology actually has had over the uh, past uh, 10 millennia and uh, also the extremely positive potential that it has over the next century. And at the same time, take seriously uh, some of the uh, risks and also really yeah, focus on uh, like which technologies are going to do the best possible job of uh, giving us uh, the yeah, kind of future that we want while at the same time minimizing and uh, even uh, actively yeah, fighting against the risks. And uh, one of the yeah, arguments that I made is uh, basically that there is this uh, important phenomenon, which is the yeah, offense-defense uh, balance, right? Basically, yeah, is it easier to attack or is it easier to defend? And if you have an environment where it's easy to attack, then you almost inevitably have this kind of dark Hobbesian choice between a very powerful sovereign and a yeah, very destructive state of anarchy. And it just inherently creates all kinds of very bad political effects uh, on top of uh, creating constant ongoing risk of suffering, right? And at the same time, this is all happening under this uh, backdrop of this uh, discussion about is AI itself, in particular, super intelligent AI, this uh, very uh, big and massive risk. If it is, should, it, should we uh, try to slow it down? But then if we do slow it down, then slowing it down forever basically just uh, creates a world that becomes more and more unstable. And so what is the actually resilient and actually long-term stable future that we uh, could be uh, aiming for? And uh, I think this, uh, uh, to me, is uh, a yeah, near and uh, mid-term uh, part of the yeah, answer, right? So in the yeah, post that I made last year, I yeah, talked, split up defensive technology into four categories. So the first split was uh, the split between the world of atoms and the yeah, world of bits. Um, so, you know, very yeah, famous distinction, might as well just, um, you know, grab it and use it. And uh, within the world of atoms, uh, split it up between uh, macro and micro. And uh, so macro defense, uh, basically you think about physical resilience um, and uh, we'll have some very uh, interesting talks uh, later today, including um, you know, topics on how to massively reduce casualties if some kind of extremely uh, terrible disaster happens to uh, humanity. Um, micro defense basically means biodefense, uh, so uh, anti-pandemics. And uh, all, both myself and a huge number of uh, other really fascinating people will be uh, talking about how we can make the, uh, our environments vastly more resilient against actually existing and even potential pandemics, all without requiring significant changes in individual behavior. So you might be pleased to know that this room is actually already passively um, airborne uh, disease resistant. Uh, so um, for example, over here, you have this um, you know, like a little fun little box and the box is a HEPA filter. We have like a bunch of these all around the room. And so basically, yeah, this uh, room be like becomes uh, vastly more safe against COVID, against any kind of future airborne virus that, co that comes up without requiring anyone to actually notice. And these, this is one example of the kinds of uh, open and uh, widely widely accessible, easily deployable, and freedom-preserving technologies that we can deploy that can give humanity or an orders of magnitude boost in its resistance against these kinds of threats. These are things that we are not doing today, and these are things that with a surprisingly low amount of investment, we could actually do a much better job at. Uh, so then on the uh, other side, we have the world of bits. And the world of bits, I, uh, I, th this is a, a distinction that is, I believe, unique to me, but I talk about the distinction between cyber defense and info defense. Cyber defense is defense against threats where all reasonable people agree who the attacker is, right? So if a DeFi protocol gets hacked, 
then obviously the DeFi smart contract doesn't agree that it got hacked because if it did, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have sent any money out. But all reasonable people looking at the situation will agree that like, well, yes, there is a, a, a hacker or at the very least someone who used a very uh, unintended mechanism to get, uh, coins, uh, out, to, to get coins out of that system. And so we can talk about cryptography, we can talk about formal verification, blockchains, zero knowledge proofs, um, you know, what I call the Egyptian God protocols, FHE and obfuscation, and also another important thing, hardware security, and actually yeah, deploying all of those technologies and actually even applying them at the level of operating systems and making sure that things are much safer than they would be today. And then info defense, uh, so this is uh, where reasonable people can actually disagree on who the attacker is. So you know, one man's uh, misinformation is uh, another man's unjustly suppressed valid point, and we need uh, you know, technologies to actually yeah, help filter through this information and help people identify yeah, I mean, like what kinds of uh, content are more likely to be actually positive and, more, and what kinds of content are more likely to be misinformative, misleading, things that even they themselves, if they better understood it, would not want to see. And, but, and uh, do so in a way that does not involve empowering a yeah, centralized elite that decides on behalf of everyone else what is, what is good and true and what is bad and false. Now, that is all a vision of defense. I think one thing that is uh, also important to talk about here is uh, I added a third dimension in the year since then, right? And I call this the survive thrive dimension. And uh, he here we talk about not just the uh, technologies to protect against the bad stuff, but also actually enabling the positive future, right? So in the uh, bio side, we have longevity. Who here is excited about longevity? <laughs> um, so, now, longevity, and then beside longevity, we also have uh, BCI, and uh, BCI is kind of conveniently beside longevity and uh, open decentralized compute, right? So on the left is making sure a compute is safe, and, uh, or at the top, making sure a compute is safe, at the bottom is making sure a compute is amazing, and compute and biology together, we get, uh, we get B B BCI acceleration. And uh, I think one of the really important points that we're going to make is that there's actually a lot of ties between these different spaces. It's all one very big integrated field. A lot of the viral persistence research that's being done in the context of long COVID right now actually has a lot of tie-ins that are very applicable to aging, right? So uh, there's recent new theories that viral persistence like actually is a, th a, a thing that's a very big contributor to Alzheimer's. And then BCI, better medical technology, could contribute, like it contributes to fighting diseases, it can contribute to living um, longer under, you know, quote, normal conditions, and it's also a, uh, a BCI accelerator. Um, now, physical abundance, uh, so, you know, we want the, uh, the big solar punk cities, we want housing to be, uh, uh, to be affordable, we want, um, you know, housing to follow Moore's law instead of following e rooms law, for those who know what those are, and, uh, and, and then, you know, we want to go to space, we want uh, everything about our physical environments to not just be resilient, but also be yeah, affordable and amazing. And finally, collaboration technology. So even in situations where people are not attacking each other, where you, you actually do have reasonable people and communities that have high trust between each other, but they do want to be able to more quickly and more effectively yeah, agree on things and come to new consensuses if we want decentralized collectives to like actually be able to act like life players and uh, make uh, bold choices and keep adapting themselves to rapidly changing circumstances without that collapsing into a yeah, dictatorship, then much more powerful collaboration technology. So this includes all of the stuff we've been doing around public goods funding. It includes uh, quadratic voting, other forms of voting, futarchy, all kinds of uh, I, I, all kinds of different uh, governance ideas, right? So basically I think there, there are natural tie-ins at all sides of this uh, between technologies that can b create an environment where everything is much more safe and much more resilient by default and an environment where we have open, distributed, and uh, widely available progress for everyone. And so this is uh, what all of the uh, speeches uh, that we're going to see today are going to be about. And uh, I'm very excited to be uh, with you and uh, listen to them. Thank you. And uh, yeah. so now I'll uh, introduce our next uh, speaker, Eli Dorado. <laughs>